Hello everyone and welcome back to the Future Tech for Education series on the EdTech podcast with support from our friends at Pearson. My name is Sophie Bailey and this week we are looking at data. I think therefore I am. For many of us this has been a foundation for how we both understand and interpret ourselves in the world. We experience, think and feel our way through. But, increasingly, data is showing us a clearer picture of what is happening and why, and in this worldview, our knowledge is limited only by processing power, cost, and interpretation of raw information. In this world, artificial intelligence enhances our ability to make sense of the world at the macro and micro level, at speed, and this has implications for how we understand not only ourselves, but also things including our health, defence and education. At the most extreme view of harnessing the power of data, what we ourselves think may only be the result of measurable chemical processes. For example, the quantified self movement argues that the self is nothing but mathematical patterns. The movement's motto is self-knowledge through numbers. If you're not a fan of databases, this seems a pretty dry way of interpreting the poignant beauty of being alive. Perhaps you'd appreciate instead the work of David McCandless, who draws beautiful conclusions from complex datasets. Here he is in action as part of TEDx Oxford. So, information is beautiful, data is beautiful. I wonder if I could make my life beautiful. And here's my visual CV. I'm not quite sure I've succeeded. Pretty blocky, colours aren't that great. But... I wanted to convey something to you. Um, you know, I started as a programmer and then I worked as a writer for many years, about 20 years in print, online, and in advertising. And only recently have I started designing. And uh, I've never been to design school, I've never studied arts or anything. I just kind of learned through doing. Uh, and when I started designing, an odd, I discovered an odd thing about myself. I already knew how to design, but it wasn't like I was amazingly brilliant at it, but more like I was sensitive to the, um, the ideas of grids and space and alignment and typography. It's almost like being exposed to all this media over the years had instilled a kind of dormant design literacy in me. Um, and I don't feel like I'm unique. I feel like every day, all of us now are being blasted by information design. It's being poured into our eyes through the web. And we're all visualizers now. And we're all demanding a visual aspect to our information. Um, and there's something almost quite magical about visual information. It, it's, it's effortless. It literally pours it in. And if you're in navigating a dense information jungle, coming across a beautiful graphic or a lovely data visualization, it's a relief. It's like coming across a clearing in the jungle. But what does this mean for education? Damien Hines, the new UK Secretary of State for Education, mentioned the role of technology and data to reduce teacher workload in his first speech as Secretary of State to a room full of ministers earlier this year. In his speech at the Education World Forum event, he stated, Technology must have a role in our sector, as it does in other sectors, to be able to ease workload, which is a matter I know is of great importance to teachers in this country, and quite rightly so. I share their drive to wish to work on that. I was curious to understand how teachers perceive the role of data in reducing their workload and or improving the outcomes of their students. Underneath a posted article by leading teacher publication TES on Twitter titled Damien Hines, Technology Will Ease Teachers' Workloads, Not Steal Their Jobs, I found the following views on data from various teachers. My experience is that the more technology we have in school, the more work individual teachers are being asked to do, particularly around data, etc. Since introducing technology into school, my workload has increased. There is such a thing as too much data. No technology equals no mountain of data to manipulate equals reduction. And even from the edtech community, when our co-founder was a teacher, he had exactly the same problem. Hashtag EdTech required more data collection, more data entry, and was aimed at giving neat spreadsheets and graphs to senior leaders. A famous edu Twitterist also shared an image recently of reams and reams of data being poured over at a governor's meeting, adding, These are the papers for our governor's school improvement committee last night. Is there a danger we get blinded by data and miss the moral purpose of education? Clearly, Twitter has a way of polarizing viewpoints. However, With technology, teachers actually sometimes do see less student work than they do with the traditional worksheet. How can resources developers best communicate about students' work to teachers? 
What instructional decisions do teachers make for which it is helpful to have data to answer? Are data points useful beyond intervention alone? And what do teachers actually seek from data and how it is presented without adding to existing workload? What latest design methods of communicating information can be used to feedback student performance to teachers whilst maintaining the agency of all stakeholders? Is the data dashboard here to stay or is there another way? Here's Christine DeSherbo, Vice President of Research at Pearson on the wranglings of data, design and personal agency within education. I think there are different purposes for data, just like actually there are different purposes for assessment. Um, are we you know, assessing for learning or assessing of learning? In the same way, we can have data for learning, that data that will help us better understand learning, help teachers better understand their teaching practice. And I think I think thinking about data that way can help teachers understand what it can do for them instead of all of the the jobs and and rigor and onerous work that that needs to be required. And as we move more and more into the digital age, I would predict that there will be less and less of them having to enter things, that all of that can be collected as students are interacting with the technology. And so instead, it becomes a, a tool to help the teachers instead of a requirement that they're having to fulfill. But I think uh, I don't uh, fault them at all for having the view that it's onerous and a difficult part of the job because that's what they've experienced up to this point. And so we need to show them and be able to demonstrate the ways that it can improve their teaching, improve their students' learning and make their lives easier before we just ask them to accept that. What has your research shown in terms of, you know, perhaps the limitations with current data presentations and thinking about how this might be improved? Very often we find that a lot of the work in terms of reporting on data has come from something that was called score reporting in the world of high stakes testing. And all of that comes from the idea that you can hear in those words of, I am going to tell you a score. And I think that's not really very helpful sometimes. <laughs> uh, instead, what we would like to think about is how can we think of this as communication about students and, and even more decision support for the people that are using these tools? And how can we present the information to them in a way that helps support them in making decisions? Which I think is a pretty different way of looking at things than reporting scores. And I think is a a key piece of this. One of the things that we've done is go out and ask teachers, what are the decisions that they'd like to make? And in doing that, we we did a a small interview study with some K-12 teachers in the U.S. and came to some pretty clear consensus that they had three main areas. What should I review with the whole class? How should I group students for a lesson on a particular topic? and which individual students are struggling with a particular misconception. And so if we think about how data should look to support those kinds of decisions, that's an interesting question, I think, for a design problem for us to address. One of the interesting things that we've seen is that when we talk to K-12 teachers, there's a growing movement of people who have things like um, groups of teachers who come together in data conferences to discuss data and to think about what they're doing with the students. And that contrasts pretty clearly with what we see with the university professors, which is certainly those kinds of practices don't exist where they're collaborating around data and talking about practice in that way. And in fact, we've heard some university professors when we interview them just say right out that um, they'll use it for intervention with particular students. They're not likely to change their overall instruction very much. So there's certainly a difference there which we see between K-12 and university and I think some potential for university professors to use the data to think a little bit more about their practice potentially. Just finally so I mean I suppose part of this is how the data is presented and I mean I suppose the predominant model currently is the the sort of generic data dashboard. So, you know, what what's the kind of thinking behind how that's evolved and why that's become the dominant model and you know how it could become a bit more nuanced. The the data dashboards that we see definitely do come from this idea that we are going to tell you a score or potentially tell you 
how many students have finished or how many students participated or what their average score was. There's some pretty clear things, but they all fall into that reporting on what was done kind of idea. And I think the place where we want to think about is what if it was instead this idea of a decision support. So for example, if I'm thinking about running a, a small group exercise in my classroom about a particular topic, I want to think about what size groups of students do I want? And do I want them to be um, homogeneous groupings of students around the same ability level? Or do I want heterogeneous groupings of students at different ability levels? But you can imagine a, an interface where I could potentially go and select the size of the student groups and whether I want them to be homogeneous or heterogeneous. And it could give me back potential groups of students. And then, you know, I could, of course, change things or whatever based on my knowledge of the students. But it would give me a place to start. And that would be very different than what we see now, which is very much the, you know, what was the average score of every student in a, you know, in a list in a, on, the, on the screen. Uh, so those are the kinds of things that I, I think we should be thinking about in, in how people interact with the computer and thinking about the, that human-computer interaction design work and uh, better supporting those decisions. The narrative of life improving through better data and therefore improved insights is well worn. In education, there are various examples. For student well-being, data can provide flags to where students may be at risk. Learner analytics systems highlight university students at risk of dropping out by identifying patterns in dropout behaviour. Some of these students may also be at risk of suicide or depression, and an alert can get human intervention to them quicker. See JISC, MapleSoft, Stucom and many more. For senior leaders, managing time and resource is a huge priority. Virtual learner environments and homework software companies like Show My Homework, Homework Together and Firefly Learning are helping to identify which students need extra assistance, whilst also connecting parents, students and teachers to help in this effort. And we already see how policymakers use data through both national regulatory or international OECD PISA tables to understand which schools and countries are, in inverted commas, doing well at education. The benefits and shortfalls of this approach are well documented. Outside of school, data is working to enhance decision making, whether that is to assist which university to attend or which job to apply for. But what do teachers actually want and need around data? What instructional decisions do teachers make where data can help? And what do they want to see more of from resources developers and edtech companies? Is there a balance between the traditional worksheet and data-driven instruction which allows the teacher and student to shine? Well, you want to know where your students are at. We are obsessed with data here in England. I spoke to Ross Morrison-McGill, aka at Teacher Toolkit, and former teacher and deputy head teacher to find out more. So hi Ross. Hello Sophie. Thanks very much for joining us. Lots of people in the UK are going to be very, very familiar um, with who you are and what you do. But just for the sake of everyone listening in, in case they're not, can you tell us, first of all, just a little bit about uh, who you are, your work in education and your sort of day to day world as well? OK, so I've uh, I've been teaching for 25 years. About 17 of those have been in school leadership. So uh, recently as a deputy head teacher. Mm -hmm. About 10 years ago, I started writing a blog. In fact, I've been blogging for about 20 years, actually, but I started writing Teacher Toolkit, and then it's just gone out of control. It's become an accidental business to the point where I wanted to consider going part-time last academic year. Uh, it's turned into kind of three or four books, um, advertising deals, blog requests, speaker requests all around the world. So it's been uh, very exciting the last three or four years. Um, now I'm doing it full time. So I've stepped out of school for the first time ever formally, uh, which is quite a scary thing for me to do. But uh, I'm enjoying it. I've been all around the UK and to Dubai. I've got more time to grow the site. So I've got about seven freelancers working with me and about 50 teachers uh, about five books on the go, and uh, I'm looking to do my PhD at Cambridge in September on social media and its um, influence on education policy, primarily in the UK, but maybe looking at other jurisdictions, particularly the, the, the PISA ranking uh, nations. So we'll see where that goes. But that's, that's me, uh, teaching's in my blood, essentially. 
with all that work on social media and building your your blog, you will know the importance of data. So I just wondered from your perspective, what's actually the kind of essential view that instructors might want? Well, you want to know where your students are at. We are obsessed with data here in England. Um, if I can just put it into very binary terms, you know, without the data pun, if I've got 30 kids in my class and you're asking me to enter an assessment point once, maybe three times a year as a minimum, and then you're asking me to look at homework progress, current target behavior and effort, that's five data decisions for one child uh, at one point of the year. And then you're going to ask me to rank that A to G or ABC or whatever it would be. We've now got this crazy system in England where we now do fine grading. So if I'm a grade B, am I a grade B1, B2, or a B3? So there's potentially 27 possible decisions that I could make for that one grade out of the five grades I need to make for that one child at that one point of the academic year. So is it any wonder that teachers are struggling under workload pressures? Um, because this is on top of the marking and planning workload and behaviour. It's to, to set an exam, to test it, to mark it, to make sure it's accurate, to then enter the data. 27 possible decisions for one grade entry, for one child, uh, times three times a year, for 30 kids. Is it any wonder that the data is then unreliable or inaccurate? Um, and actually, by the time it's ended and analysed, it's probably too late to make any meaningful intervention in the classroom. So I really think we need to strip back and go to ultimate basics. You know, data is just a snapshot of time. Um, we know that the, the, full, the whole child is more than just data. It's the social, emotional, mental health. We have to triangulate conversations with other colleagues, with parents at home, with watching Ross play football after school, um, to seeing how he behaves on the playground, the corridor, that, that kind of true differentiation and assessment, uh, triangulating a multitude of sources to get the full picture of a child. Now that takes an academic year or a key stage to gather that data about a child. So, you know, data is a snapshot. It's useful to a certain degree. It can inform, but it can also, as we have all experienced in our schooling, uh, it labels a child and it potentially might limit our potential. If you were to be able to redesign what you did input and therefore have a view of back, what data do you think is essential in terms of actually aiding instruction? I'd have to give it some thought. Um, I would firstly strip back the number of decisions being made. Just like anything, whether we're marking in the classroom or not, we want to find out what the purpose is of assessment. Largely, my entire teaching career and particularly school leadership recently, the data has been used to determine patterns, to then inform predictions. The kind of secondary decision has always been, or the secondary outcome has always been, right, so where is it not working? Let's go and intervene or let's pull this teacher out or this class or this group of kids because there's going to be a car crash happening and it's going to go against us in league tables or an Ofsted inspection. Now, I've worked in outstanding and special measure schools, and I, I would largely say those final conversations such as those are pretty much, you know, three quarters, 90% of the, the conversation, rather than let's just look at how kids are doing and let's make it better. It's always been to try and tweak and to hold kids to account, hold teachers to account. Um there's a great question Tom Sherrington, so on Twitter at Teacher Head, always poses when I work with him at various events. If, if your data dashboard blew up overnight, how long would it take for the kids to notice? And, you know, most people always laugh in the room because the kids wouldn't have a clue. Um, if I take you back to when you were a child at school and you think of your school reports, did your school report ever improve you as a learner? Probably not. If I, th if I ask you what the most significant memories of you as a child were at school, there were most likely things that happened at school but outside of the classroom because we create those powerful moments that, you know, such as the sports day, the prom, going on a ski trip to Germany, rather than you sit and doing a test where you're viewed to pass or fail and compared against all your all your mates. What's your views on marking and, and, uh, and feedback and how data is important for that as well? You're going to get my blood boiling here. Um, I, in the last six months, when I've been doing teacher training, I've got this really fancy bit of software where people can send anonymous feedback to me on a screen. 
whether I'm working with 15 or 500 teachers, time and time and time again, regardless of setting international, primary, secondary, private, you know, or state school, teachers just say marking is the biggest burden on, on, on teachers. And it's a multitude of reasons. I think it's parent expectations, our own perceptions of what we think our school leaders want. And if you're a school leader, it's our perceptions of what the external visitor wants. And time and time again, I'm having confirmed that the external visitor often trumps any good practice that you do in school because they want the evidence from you that you work there for a year or five or 20 years for when they visit for a half a day or a couple of hours, they want some hard evidence that, that can show, demonstrate progress, whatever it might be. And for me, there lies the, the flaw or the Achilles heel in the entire system. At no point in that last paragraph have I mentioned the child. If I am marking uh, uh, or, or teaching some kids in my class, never mind marking, I would need to give them immediate feedback. That's verbal. I might be able to do a bit of live marking in the classroom work and get their work under the camera. All the kids can see it. You know, I'm trying to teach all 30 kids at once. Um, I, I, I scribble on a piece of work, show them how it would be marked. The kids all then get that immediate feedback rather than me taking 30 books home and marking it two or three weeks later when it's too late. Uh, you, you look at any setting, art, drama, sport, uh, the feedback is immediate, it's on your feet, um, kids can make immediate progress. It's not observed, it's not recorded, but at some point we obviously need to do a kind of formal test. If our assessment and examination systems are going to require people to complete X number of hours or credits or, or modules to get a qualification, then then fine, we do need to have some rigour and some standardized framework i understand that but um i think where it's all got a bit confused and out of control is how many data decisions or for what purpose or how often um and when it's reported the burden on teachers and then ultimately what impact does that have on the kid in the classroom and what do they know about it i'll give you one very simple example my son who i'm kind of watching very closely about his progress in year two he was writing a sentence or doing a maths equation or whatever it was. And as a, the teacher and parent in me, obviously wanted to unpick what he was learning and asked him, what does it mean? And his response was simply, I'm a level four, uh, I'm nearly a five. And that was his only definition of what he'd learned. He actually hadn't, hadn't understood what he was learning. Um, he just put it into what the teacher had told him in terms of the assessment. Uh, and, and for me, uh, that's the rubber seal of... We've lost the purpose of assessment. Um, our evidence trails and our data collection in England ha has just lost its meaning, and I think we just need to strip back and start again. There's one um, book that I've read in the last six months uh, called The End of Average by Todd L. Rose, who's a Harvard graduate, and, and he has uh, kind of articulated and affirmed everything I, I've always believed as a student, as a, as a teacher, as a school leader, and as a parent. Um, about standardized tests and he, he talks about um, individuality versus averagism I, I take a test and rather than being assessed against another individual I'm assessed against everybody else a hundred or a thousand people or all the people that took the test last academic year and then I'm ranked he articulates the problems we currently have the external pressures uh, we have to sit the same course in the same amount of time regardless of our ability uh, where the process is kind of set up to make it easier for the teacher or for the school rather than for the, for the kid. I want to give some good alternatives or, or kind of blueprint, uh, looking at credentials, not degrees, uh, getting rid of grades and giving competency um, and letting people choose. You know, we all love choices. Um, I've chosen to do this podcast. Um, it, it, if I could choose to select my own pathway um, I'm going to be more engaged with my learning. So it, 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 that's the end of average. I'd highly recommend it to people listening to have a read. As for me, you can follow me on Teacher Toolkit on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, all the different channels, and the website, teachertoolkit.co.uk. Um, and, and thanks for having me, Sophie. That's great. Well, thank you very much, Ross. Is this approach being considered by the design community? Samantha Ahern, Learning Technology Project Officer at the Information Services Division of UCL, is part of a group working on data-informed blending learning design, trying to answer some of these questions. I spoke to her about how to balance the role of teacher, student and software and using data insight without allowing it to dominate. So I'm part of the digital education team at UCL 
and in particular I'm part of the futures team so we're the people that are the horizon scanning team really so we look at what's the current trend what's likely to be something that's of use to us as an institution and we basically have a play with things so in my role as project officer I've, I've been having a look at learning analytics in particular for the last year or so um, how I come to do that is that I've had a mixture of a background I like data I understand education I'm suitably paranoid and I understand how this machine learning stuff works mostly so I've been the right set of skills in position to to have a look at this learning analytics thing that was starting to get a big buzz about it so how we got in contact is uh, I was developing up this episode on data and you had posted a blog titled uh, TPAC or TPCK, Data and, and Learning Design on the UCL Digital Education blog. So I wondered if you could share a little bit with our listeners uh, what that blog post was all about and your project that you've been collaborating on with various partners and JISC as well. Yeah, so learning analytics, if I start there, you can look at things in two ways. You can look at the learner which is what I spend a lot of time thinking about. Actually, I worry a lot about student well-being and mental health. And that's the main section of what I do. And the other part is the learning element and the learning design bit, which I think is, is quite crucial. So TPCK is a paper on technology, pedagogy and curricular knowledge. And the idea is that basically these three things should technically form a braid. So they are intrinsically intertwined. So having been someone that studied technology and taught technology, certainly in my mind, these things are intertwined. So for me, it's natural to try to use the technology at my disposal in a pedagogic way. And that is intrinsically tied into my curricular knowledge. But, you know, I understand for people from other disciplines, this isn't always so easy. But my point was that you can use the technology as part of your pedagogy. We've got a fantastic colleague at UCL who makes full use of our live lecture streaming to embed all the quizzes to make her lecture as interactive as she possibly can. So she's using the technology as part of pedagogy. If you know what technology is used in your knowledge area, in your, your area of work, then you can put more meaningful use of technology into your teaching. So um, when I was at secondary level, I, I was involved in a lot of the IC2 across the curriculum work, embedding that into other departments. And I saw a lot of bolt-on activities, so posters and things that, that didn't really add value. But if you're doing science, you can do sensors that automatically read data, and that becomes a much more meaningful use of technology. Just to kind of follow on from that, so this week's episode, the, the kind of starting point, I suppose, was looking at this idea of, you know, you've got a whole range of services out there that are offering sort of data dashboard, LMS-type um, services, but sometimes that actually can almost limit the view on what a teacher is able to see in terms of a student's work. So where's the kind of balance, do you think, from a sort of learning design point of view between you know, having agency from a teacher point of view, so being able to get a real depth of insight into what a student is doing, and then versus also balancing that with the efficiency of, you know, having your data refined so that you can take action. What, what's kind of your view on that? <laughs> yeah, so we've been taking that. So you, you said the work with, with Jessica and, and some of my colleagues. So we use Moodle as Alveoli. It produces no end of data and you can produce a huge activity report. But yeah, it, it, it's, it's big. And what do we do with it? So actually, we kind of gone the other way. It's got to the point now we're, we're saying to academics, well, what are you interested in? What are the questions you've got about this learning design? What are the things that you want to check are happening. So quite often uh, academics come in and we'll, we'll put them through our learning design process and they'll have adjusted a design. So, so we talk about six dimensions and this comes from Diana Laurelard's work. And you might have bumped up communication, but how do you know you've actually bumped up the communication element? So saying, okay, so what are your questions about this design? What do you want to make sure the students have understood? What do you want to check that you have actually adjusted? Where do you want to see if they're on track with it? And then we identify the data that's going to be the hook to give you the answer to the question. So we kind of come the other way. We say, OK, this is great. This is your design. These are the things that are happening. What do you want to know about it? And then the data comes later. So we're, we're funneling it down to small bits. 
And and what's the kind of feedback been on that when with this sort of new refined, less sort of data waterfall type approach, more more sort of focusing in on what the actual lecturer wants from it? We don't know yet. <laughs> um, we did run past some of our ideas for it at an international learning design network meeting a couple of weeks ago. And and they very much like the idea that, you know, you're identifying the things that are important to you and, and making this small data and meaningful data and not just this this kind of avalanche of, of things. Certainly when I, I was in Golden Compulsory Education, you had an awful lot about data about um, students' particular grades, about their scores for various different tests. You were termly or half termly reporting back on national curriculum levels and, and there is a lot of data there and you know you had to mark up your seating plans on different things and be very aware and that, that is part and parcel of the role but some of that data can get a bit too much you know they changed the format of um how they wanted your lesson design written I think one time I ended up writing the same six week plan about four times because they kept adjusting the template so um yeah so some things that but um so, so that's one level of stuff. In terms of the learning design, it's about knowing what you want and, and, and being savvy about it. And, and that shouldn't create more work, really. It should be part of the reflection cycle. So in compulsory, I would have 30 students in the room and I'd have a pretty good idea from looking at them what they had and they hadn't got. When you're talking to students, you know, you can see when they're glazing over it. You can see something's not quite right in their expression. Um, I think the difference is, is when you're staring at, at 250, 300 students in a lecture hall, you can't quite get that back. Um, so that's where the technology in my mind helps. So the lecture cap system that we've got, um, if students are in real time, it actually allows them to flag things they don't understand. Um, previous versions would hotspot sections of the video so you could see what they watched a lot. So you could identify what was sticky or, or a particular interest to them. So that could feed back in. So whereas before I, I would see they hadn't got it or I could see what they were doing in the class and they hadn't got it, I could refine it the following week. So when you've got 250, that, that's harder, but you can look at what they've done, what notes they've taken, that kind of thing in the lecture, recording stuff, and you can tweak. So it, it's the same process. It's just, in a way, almost industrializing it to scale. It's a very interesting take because I guess the, the idea to start with is – you know, to what extent can you see the personalities, the whites and the eyes that you mentioned when you're looking at data points on a screen? But at the same point, you don't have that luxury if you are, you know, lecturing to 200 people in a lecture hall. So the, the technology becomes useful then. And I suppose there's a further argument after that is, you know, is the lecture hall the right, the right setting as well? But it's just, yeah, always that balance between the personal experience and connection between you and a and a student potentially, but then also if there are large groups, how do you have useful information to hand to help equip you as well? Yeah, I mean, it was really interesting that um, Simon Lancaster, um, who teaches uh, in UEA actually, and you know, his students have always performed well. He said, I knew they knew stuff, they set the exam, they passed it, but he was never entirely sure they understood. So he tweaked his way of, of teaching and uses more kind of so Socratic type questioning to check the understanding. Because that's more important than just the knowledge bit of ticking. Yes, they got X percentage in a in a test. So I think we can be clever, and we can use the technology to our advantage to make it more engaging and interesting, even if we have got a large cohort. So there is a distinction between top-down data requests and co-created data points. Is small and useful data what we should be now working towards? Across the pond, Jeff Diffenbach from MIT Science of Learning is also trying to answer these questions. I spoke to him recently in Austin about what appears to be working for teachers and students and how to refine the presentation of data so as to keep the teacher involved. So I've been in education in one form or another since about 2000. I was elected as a school board member in a town with about 13,000 people and 2,800 kids in the district. So I got to see from the parent and the, the sort of administration of the school side, what education was about. A few years after that, got into work as a software product manager with a company that created reading skill development software. And since then have been with a number of larger and smaller companies that focus on the education market, sometimes pre-K-12, sometimes higher ed, and sometimes workplace learning, and then uh, ended up at MIT. 
So having the experience of working with teachers directly, and, and directly is perhaps a bit of a stretch, but as part of my school committee role, we would have teachers come in and talk to our meetings. We'd have opportunities to engage with them, sometimes even observe classes just to see sort of what was really going on. Um, I think as parents, we've all come up through an education system, so we have that view of it, which is by then a generation out of date. Yeah. Um, but being able to sort of always pull back to what it looks like for a teacher in a classroom informs the work that I do really everywhere, but certainly at MIT. Oh, well, that brings me on to this episode. So we're looking at data and, you know, to what extent it's communicated in a useful way to instructors. And in fact, the last person that I interviewed, we started uh, talking a little bit about this idea of small data. So we've gone through the whole big data cycle, as it were, and, and actually we need to kind of refine how that's communicated so that it's actually useful to instructors. So what's your kind of take on data? Yeah, so I think teachers inherently have a sense of the kids in their classroom. But for instance, to know that a student is struggling to read doesn't necessarily mean you know exactly which part of reading they're struggling with. Is it the correspondence between sounds and symbols? Is it a fluency problem? Is it a vocabulary problem? And so the extent to which data and, and a well-designed dashboard can sh shrink the amount of time that a teacher needs and help them get the right next piece of instruction to a student, that's kind of the theory of it. In practice, we're really still sort of in the Model T era of, of ed tech and, and finding the right systems that get the right answer to a teacher. So if a teacher's time can be shortened by virtue of the technology, then it's a win. If it forces more time on their part, well, then they're probably better off just going with their intuitions. So I'm a staff member at MIT working with faculty who study learning effectiveness. And that can be at the level of using brain scans to understand what's happening in the brain of a child when he or she's learning, to economists using large data analytics tools to examine the impact of policy decisions. We've got a project that should be announced this week, um, but I can certainly talk about what it's about. It's about assessments and interventions for struggling readers, grades kindergarten through three. And it's about how we can take big data of brain scan, because a brain scan generates a ton of data, and try to figure out early when children are struggling and why, figure out what intervention, what instruction is best for them next and then simplify that so that the classroom teacher can use it. They're not requiring a big magnetic resonance imaging machine in their classroom to scan the brain of a child, but to find the sort of shortcut to map the problem with the instructional answer. Again, with reading software, sometimes kids can work for 20 or 30 minutes at a time going through a series of activities that seem almost like games to the child, but that are also collecting data that whole time. And that data can then be mapped against what the software knows about that particular child and that particular child's history. And again, if it allows a flag to be raised for the teacher when the teacher's help is most valuable, but allowing the child to sort of progress and make mistakes and correct mistakes on his or her own, then it's sort of win-win. The, the, the child's always in that sweet spot of learning and the teacher's always there to really drop in when the, the sort of human level skills are best applied. We've heard about these technologies and this research coming out, but how much is actually changing in terms of instructor practice and you know whether this goes beyond sort of intervention and, and actually changes their style of teaching are you seeing a lot of that or you know is it still does that take longer so I think that's also a bit spotty um, every teacher is going to be embracing technology differently depending on his or her experience but I think teachers when they're used to technology that works, and, and it's not only just the software application, the reading application, but it's the Wi-Fi, it's the printer, it's the ability to project. Once that's locked down and pretty solid, then the teacher can start to depend on it, not be worried that, oh, I have to have a backup lesson plan in case the technology fails. And, and how about, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, you've worked in software side, you've worked now working at MIT. Do you have any either books or people or resources that have kind of influenced you on that journey that you continue to go back to or you'd like to share with our listeners? So there's a great book, Make It Stick. I believe the lead author is Brown, although I might be getting that wrong, Peter Brown, I think, but Make It Stick is the book. And it's about trying to take the learning science and make it accessible to the practitioner. Sort of in the same way that a teacher can't wade through 
tons and tons of data taking lots and lots of time, they can't wade through the research. They need to have a translation of the research into practical, actionable things that they can do in the classroom that they know are backed up by research, that they could explore if they want to, but that they can trust. And how about if people are listening in and they'd like to connect with you as well? So we can be reached at uh, mightily, M-I-T-I-L-I dot M-I-T dot E-D-U. There's a contact us page there and uh, we'd love to hear from people. And uh, you know, again, um, we're MIT, uh, we're always about learning and much of the learning that we come across is from outside our campus, uh, but it's, it, what, it's what makes us strong to be able to tap into that sort of broad range of experience out there. Fantastic, well thank you very much, Jeff. You're welcome, great to be with you. So, data must come with human interpretation. Let's remember the design and user needs of the teachers, but also handle the data with sensitivity. I'll leave with this quote from Tim Berners-Lee, inventor of the World Wide Web. Data is a precious thing and will last longer than the systems themselves. That's the end of this week's episode. Thanks to all of this week's guests and thank you all for listening in. We'll be back soon with our final episode from the Future Tech for Education series, looking at some amazing work happening internationally. Have a great week. Throughout human history, one of our big successes has been the development of more and more technology. How do we move the student forward? How does the student move themselves forward? And that what is an application of skills and knowledge at a moment in time? What should the humans do versus what should you let technology do? I think it opens up a whole world of possibilities. We are seeing improvements of learning as a function of playing different games. So as educators, we have to stop and say, how do we approach this? It's so cool that we can get students to engage with computations and so on. Everybody's got to be in the learning business. Want to leave feedback? Tweet us at Podcast EdTech and at Christine DeSherbo, or check out the Pearson podcast page at tinyurl.com forward slash Pearson Future Tech, where you can also find more content reports and insight. I'll drop that link, show notes, and more at the EdTechPodcast.com.